common inquiry into our technical department is relating to the use of our quinolate blocks below DBC and the requirement for tanking the blocks in a bituminous type substance for the use in this application. I'd first like to point out that quinolate have full third party certification for use below DBC so all the relevant freeze thaw tests etc have been carried out and there's no issues with structural performance when using the blocks in this application. I would also point out however that to get the best thermal performance of the blocks they should be kept dry but there should be no requirement in most instances to thank the blocks and bitumen to achieve this. So here we're going to look at two typical details to see how we can keep these blocks dry quite easily. So the first detail here we have insulation below a slab so for 150 concrete slab here our insulation below this I've chosen insulation thickness of 175 it's all as good practice for your insulation thickness to coincide with block work coarsen. So here we have a soap bar 100 mil deep and a standard block which is 225 mil deep making an overall depth of 325. So if our subfloor and our insulation equates to 325 it makes life easier on site. In some instances we may say 175 is too thick for insulation is achieving U values well in excess of what we need. However we can look at alternative lower performing insulations. For example here we could use EPS, Pearl, which is a grey EPS or even ordinary white EPS to achieve the U values we require. Here I've shown partial fill cavity wall insulation. We have a concrete block inner and outer leaf. However, the inside leaf could alternatively be a timber frame. A rail on barrier here is on the leafy insulation, goes up over this block out and down over the DPC and the inner and outer leaf. Typically needs to be a minimum of 150 above ground level. And I've shown the DPC sealed with the radon barrier at this location, which is good practice. Here, as you can see highlighted in green, this is where the wall insulation and the floor insulation are broken. So here we have introduced the quinlite block. We have a free draining cavity below the insulation and we have a perforated drainage channel out here. So any water running down the inside of this block freely drains out and away from the structure. This is good practice in all building to have proper drainage around your building. So if we look at this particular block here, it's protected from moisture by the radon barrier. So the only way this block can get wet is through rising damp from this block beneath. So to keep that block dry we can simply introduce a DPC at this location and you can let that on out underneath your radon barrier as necessary. So now we have a quinlate block here which is fully protected from moisture and it will be dry in all instances. And here in this detail there's no requirement for tanking or dipping the blocks in bitumen. So we look now at a second common floor construction. So here we have insulation above the slab. <coughs> so we have our concrete subfloor here. We have our insulation and our screed. Here I've shown 75 millimeters of screed and 150 millimeters of insulation, which adds up to 225, which again coincides with block work caution. <coughs> The wall construction is the same as above, again this could easily be a timber frame in our leaf and again we have the free draining cavity here to allow any water running down the cavity to drain off. Insulation should not be sitting in water so it's important that that insulation, or the cavity is fully drained below the insulation. So again here you can see the DPM or the radon barrier running out up over this block down and out. <coughs> so already you can see that the quinlite block in this detail is pr already protected from rising damp so there's no requirement for any additional DPC in this construction. Again we have our DPC on the inner leaf out, down and sealed to the radon barrier which again is good practice. So as we can see again here there's no requirement for the use 
of any sort of bitumous type products to coat or dip the blocks to keep them dry. That block dry is dry in that application and it achieves its best thermal performance. So we've looked at two situations where our quinolite blocks can easily be kept dry at that critical floor to wall junction. We're going to look now at what happens to the quinolite blocks if they are subject to moisture. It has been brought to our attention that on some situations the detail hasn't been done correctly and the block may be subject to rising damp. So we've done some in-house testing to see how moisture will affect the thermal performance of the blocks. So if we look at our typical quinolite B7 block, the thermal performance of that block in its dry state is 0 0.19 watts per meter kelvin. What we've done with that block then, we submerged that block in water for 48 hours, then took the block out of the water and tested it straight away. So the block was at full saturation. And the test result revealed that the thermal conductivity of that block at full saturation was 0 0.33 watts per meter kelvin. And if we look at this detail here, even if that DPC wasn't in there, which is an incorrect detail, but if it wasn't there, the block is only subject to rising damp, so that block will never get close to full saturation. So these figures here are based on full saturation, which is really is worst case. We look then at our quinolate B3, the dry conductivity of that block is 0 0.12 watts per meter kelvin. The fully saturated conductivity tested at 0 0.29 watts per meter kelvin. The interesting thing about this particular figure here is if we look at another common thermal block which has now been used throughout Ireland, the lightweight aggregate block, the thermal conductivity of that block in its dry state is 0 0.33 watts per meter kelvin. So even if the detail is not done correctly, like we've shown earlier on, the thermal performance of our block in its fully saturated state, which is absolute worst case, is still on a par with a dry lightweight aggregate block. So what we must ask ourselves is what's the thermal performance of a lightweight aggregate block in its wet state? and that we don't know. So why is it so important then to use quinolite blocks at our key junctions and to detail the junction correctly so that the quinolite block is kept dry? A recent thermal bridging study carried out on 17 key junctions compared the say values across that junction between quinolite, dense blocks and later aggregate blocks. Dense blocks, self-explanatory, are standard masonry units. Lighted aggregate blocks are a thermal block and they're manufactured using lighted aggregates. It's important to note that the quinolate block outperformed both these other blocks in all of the 17 key junctions. Compared to the dense block, the quinolate block performed up to 750% better across the key junction. When compared to the lighter aggregate block, the quinolate block performed up to 200% better across the key junctions. So if we look at these figures, it's a no-brainer that a quinolate block should be used to get the best thermal performance across our key junctions. So we've looked at two typical details and looked at how the quinolate block can easily be kept dry to get or maximise its thermal performance. A full range of details are available in our accredited construction details on our website. In addition, our technical team are on hand to work with you to develop any additional details that may not be available currently.